Marley was dead to begin with. There's no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it, and Scrooge's name was good upon change for anything he chose to put his hand to. Scrooge and Marley were partners for I don't know how many years, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone was Scrooge, a squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. And once upon a time, of all the good days in the year, on Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house, a grim, cheerless place if ever there was one. The door of Scrooge's counting house was open that he might keep his eye upon his clerk, Bob Cratchit, who in a cold and dismal little cell beyond, worked at his ledgers. 19, 20, 21, 22. <laughs> 23, 26, 29, 9, carry 2. 17, 13, 17. Bob Cratchit! Uh, yes, Mr. Scrooge? Stop that infernal caterwauling! Uh, yes, sir. 9, 15, 17. Okay, the six Singing their room. idiotic Christmas carols at my very door. Go on, get away from my door. Go somewhere else and bellow your blasted carols or I'll give you. Oi, Governor. It's an old custom at Christmas time, you know. Yes, and I don't want any of your old customs. Take your fellow fools and go away. Christmas. Blech. Right, sir. Merry Christmas anyway, sir. Ah, now. You get that letter from Higgins and Blackthorn, Cratchit. And then I want you to finish posting this ledger. And after that, you can pop over to Parthagill's and tell F from Parthagill you've come after the 17 shillings and sixpence he's owed me since Michaelmas. And tell him I shall have a constable over there if he doesn't pay up at once. Mr. Parthagill's wife has been ill, sir. Oh, what do I care about his wife? I want my 17 and 6. I, I, I just thought it being Christmas, sir. Christmas? Christmas. You mention that word to me once more, Bob Cratchit, and I'll... A Merry Christmas, Uncle! A Merry Christmas, Bob! A Merry Christmas, Mr. Fred! God save you, Uncle! Bah! Humbug. Christmas a humbug, Uncle? Now I'm sure you don't mean that. I mean just that. Exactly that. Merry Christmas. What right have you to be merry? What reason have you? You're poor enough. Well, what right have you to be dismal about Christmas, Uncle? You're rich enough. Bah. Now, Uncle, don't be cross. Well, what else can I be when I live in such a world of fools? What's Christmas to you but a time for paying bills without money? Merry Christmas. A time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer. If I could work my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. He should. Uncle! Now, nephew, keep Christmas in your way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it? But you don't keep it, Uncle. Well, let me leave it alone then. What do you want? A Christmas gift, I no doubt. I came to wish you a Merry Christmas, Uncle. A Merry Christmas. Much good may Christmas do you. <laughs> Much good has ever done you. There are many things from which I derive good by which I have not profited materially. I have always thought of Christmas time as a good time. A kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. And therefore, Uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe it has always done me good and will do me good. And I say, God bless it. God bless Christmas! Hooray! Let me hear another sound out of you there, Cratchit. And you'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. As to you, nephew, I wonder you don't go into Parliament. You talk enough nonsense. Oh, don't be angry, Uncle. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why can't we be friends? Good afternoon. I'm sorry you feel that way, Uncle. Well, I tried. A Merry Christmas to you, Uncle. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year, too! Bah! Humbug. And a Merry Christmas to you, Bob, and the missus, and to Tiny Tim. Oh, thank you, Mr. Fred, and same to you, sir. Good day, sir. Good day, Bob. Twaddle flummery. Talking of Christmas and not two sixpence to, to jingle together in his trousers pocket. Hey, hey, you there, Bob Cratchit, come here. What are you doing there? I'm only 
putting a bit more coal in the fire, Mr. Scrooge, seeing as it's so very cold in here, sir. You put that coal back into the scuttle. A fire. A fire indeed. I can tell you, if you use coal at that rate, you and I will soon be parting company, Bob Cratchit. You understand that? There's many a young fella like your situation, you know. I'm sorry, sir. My fingers uh, are getting a little stiff with the cold. And then, then put on your mittens. There's someone at the door. Go on, see who it is. Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Is this the firm of Scrooge and Marley? Yes, sir. I should like to see the head of the firm, if I may. Oh, very good, sir. What is it? A gentleman to see you, Mr. Scrooge. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Marley's been dead these seven years tonight. I'm Scrooge. Well, uh, now, Mr. Scrooge, at this season of year, it's only fitting that we who are more fortunate should raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. You may not believe it, sir, but many thousands are now in want of the common necessities. Uh. And hundreds of thousands are in want of the simplest comforts. Are there no prisons? Well, sir, there are plenty of prisons, sir. And the workhouses? They're still in operation, I trust. I wish I could say they are not, but they are, sir. The treadmill and the pole are in full vigor, then? Both very busy, sir. Ah, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> I was afraid from what you said at first that something had occurred to stop them in their useful course. No, sir. All these institutions that you have mentioned are flourishing, but there is nevertheless true that some additional provisions of the poor and destitute must be made. Pah. A few of us, upon change, are endeavoring to raise such a fund. And, uh, what shall I put you down for? Nothing. Oh, I see. You wish to be anonymous, sir. I wish to be left alone. I don't make merry myself at Christmas time, and I can't afford to help make a lot of idle people merry. I help to support the establishments that take care of the poor. They cost enough. Let those who are badly off go there. Many can't go there, sir, and many would rather die. Then my advice to them is to do so and decrease the surplus population. Besides, I have only your word for it that all this is so. It's the truth, Mr. Scrooge. Well, so be it then. It's not my business. It's enough for a man to understand his own business and not to interfere with other people's. Mine occupies me constantly. Good afternoon, sir. No, I quite understand. Mr. Scrooge, good afternoon. Cratchit, show this gentleman out. Yes, sir. This way, sir, please. Sir, I couldn't help overhearing. I should like to contribute tuppence. Cratchit! Uh, yes, sir. It isn't much, but it's all I can afford. There are others in worse situation than I. You are a generous fellow. I wish I might say so of your employer. Cratchit! Uh, yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Cratchit! Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Y yes, sir. Close the door. Uh, yes, sir. 24, 31, 1, carry 3, a new scarlet tippet for Tiny Tim, a comb for Martha, 33, 3, and carry 3, a hair ribbon for Belinda, 4, 7, 12. Cratchit! Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's too late to have you go to Parthagill's. He'll be closed up for Christmas like these other fools. We may as well close up the place now. Yes, sir. It is getting a little dark. Hard to see the figures. I, I suppose you'll want the entire day tomorrow? If it's quite convenient, it's sir. It's not convenient. And it's not fair either. But I suppose I can't do anything about it. <laughs> if, if I was to stop half a crown of your wages, you'd think yourself very ill used. I'll be bound. Well, sir, I... I yeah, uh, but you don't think me ill used when I pay a day's wages for no work. It's only once a year, once sir. Once a year? Once a year, indeed. A fine excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. But I suppose there's no good talking. You must have the whole day. Well, see that you're here all the earlier the next morning, you understand? Oh, I will, sir. I will indeed. Good night, sir, and Merry Christmas. Bah! Merry Christmas. Bah! <laughs> The 
The office was closed in a twinkling, and Bob Cratchit, with the long ends of his white comforter dangling below his waist, for he boasted no greatcoat, went down a slide on Cornhill twenty times in honor of its being Christmas Eve, and then ran home to Camden Town as hard as he could pelt to play with his family at Blind Man's Bluff. Scrooge, on the other hand, took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern. Having read all the newspapers and spent the rest of the evening with his banker's book, went to his dismal house. Darkness is cheap, and Scrooge liked it. The yard was so dark that even Scrooge, who knew its every stone, had to grope with his hands through the fog and the frost to find the door. Scrooge walked through his rooms to see that all was right. Sitting room, bedroom, lumber room, all as they should be. Nobody under the table, nobody under the sofa, nobody under the bed, nobody in the closet. Close the door. He locked himself in. He double locked himself in and took off his cravat, put on his dressing gown and slippers and his nightcap and sat down before the fire to take his gruel. <coughs> Molly. Molly. Marley. I could have sworn I sold. Ah, humbug. Marley's been dead these seven years. Humbug. All oh, humbug. What I need is a good night's. What? What's that? Someone's in the wine cellar, but the door's locked and double locked. Something. Something's coming. So. Something is coming closer outside my door. I won't believe it. It's humbug still. Ebenezer Scrooge. Ebenezer Scrooge. Molly. Oh, no. What do you want with me? I want much of you, Ebenezer. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Oh, oh, you're very particular for a ghost. All right, then. Who were you? In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Jacob Marley? But, but you're dead. You died seven years ago. Seven years ago this very night. What's wrong, Ebenezer? Don't you believe in me? I do not. You doubt your senses, Ebenezer? Yes. Yes, because a little thing affects me. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheats. You can't be a ghost. You may be an undigested bit of beef, or a blot of mustard, or a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an underdone potato. <laughs> there may be more gravy than grave about you, whatever you are. Ah, humbug, I tell you. Humbug. <gasps> I do believe in you. You are a ghost, Jacob. Thank you. But, but why, why do you walk the earth, Jacob? Why do you come to me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow man and travel far and wide to witness what it cannot share but might have shared on earth and turned to happiness. But tell me, Jacob... What is that chain you wear around you? I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link and yard by yard by my own free will. Is its pattern strange to you, Ebenezer? Cash boxes? Keys and padlocks? Ledgers and purses? Yours was as heavy and as long as this seven years ago. You've labored on it since, Ebenezer. Oh, Jacob, speak comfort to me, Jacob. Comfort I have none to give. I cannot rest, I cannot stay, I cannot linger. Weary journeys lie before me. You, you travel fast? Yes, Ebenezer, on the wings of the wind. Uh, seven years dead and traveling all the time? Seven years, Ebenezer, seven years of remorse. Ebenezer, do you know that no space of regret 
can make amends for one life's opportunities misused. But you were always a good man of business, Jacob. Business? Mankind was my business. Charity, mercy, benevolence, they were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. Jacob, Jacob, don't take on so now. Jacob! Listen to me, Ebenezer! I'll listen to you, Jacob. Go on, Jacob, now. Speak to me, but don't be so flowery. Ebenezer! I'm here to warn you that you have yet a chance of hope of escaping my fate. Do you hear that, Ebenezer? Yes, Jacob. Yes, you always were a good friend to me, Jacob. Thanks, Jacob, but but go on, go on, go on, go on. How shall I escape? Oh, I'm afraid, Jacob. You will be haunted by three spirits. Is that the only chance and hope, Jacob? It is your only chance and hope. Well, then, I think I'd rather not. Without their visits, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first ghost tomorrow when the bell tolls one. Couldn't I take them all at once and have it over, Jacob? Ebenezer, look that! For your own sake, you remember what has passed between us. When the bell tolls one, look for the first spirit! Molly! Jacob Molly! Scrooge awoke. He was lying on his bed, fully dressed. Suddenly, the curtains of his bed were drawn aside, and Scrooge found himself face to face with the unearthly visitor who drew them. It was a strange figure, like a child, yet not so like a child as like an old man. Its hair, which hung about its neck and down its back, was white as if with age, and yet the face had not a wrinkle in it, and the tenderest bloom was on the skin. The arms were long and muscular, the hands the same, as if its hold were of uncommon strength. Ebenezer Scrooge. Oh, who? Who's that? Ebenezer Scrooge, I've come for you. You? Are you the spirit, sir, whose coming was foretold to me? I am that spirit. Who? What are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. L- long past? No, your past. But... What do you want of me? What brings you here to haunt me? Your welfare, Ebenezer Scrooge. Rise and walk with me. Oh, no, 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 no. no! Not out of the window. Why well, I can't do that. I'll fall down. I'm not a spirit. I'm mortal and I'll fall. Bear but a touch of my hand upon your heart, and you shall be upheld in more than this. Come, follow me. Where are we? What's become of the city? And there's snow upon the ground. Where are we? These are the shadows of things that have been. You recognize this countryside? I know every inch of it, every rock, every tree. And that bleak building over there. Ah, that building. (laughs) I was a boy there. Yes, I went to school in that horrible place. Do you recollect that path? (laughs) I could walk it blindfold. Strange you should have forgotten it so many years. Come, let us go closer. Look through the window into that cold, barren room. What do you see, Ebenezer Scrooge? I see a boy. A solitary child, neglected by his family, alone. Yes, yes, I see, I know that boy. Oh, oh, I was so lonely, poor boy. Your lip is trembling, Scrooge. And what is it on your cheek? It's nothing, nothing at all. I wish I... Uh, it's, it's too late now. What's the matter? Nothing, nothing. The waves came to my door seeing Christmas carols last night, and there was a boy like that among them. A poor, pale, thin little boy in a ragged coat. I should like to have given him something, that, that's all. Is that all? 
Come, Ebenezer Scrooge, let us see another Christmas. Do you see this place, Ebenezer Scrooge? Know it? Know it? This is the counting house where I was apprenticed. It's my old master, bless his heart, old Fezziwig, my master alive again and hosting one of his Christmas parties. <laughs> Pick your partner. Listen to him. Corkscrew, thread the needle and back to your places. Oh, and there's Dick Wilkins. Poor Dick, dear, dear, dear. Oh, yes, and look, there's Mrs. Fezziwig herself looking younger than any of them. And the table's all loaded with roasts and cider, mince pie and beer. Oh, what a jolly time we used to have. That carefree young man with the light heart and the gay smile. Do you recognize him? Yes, 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 merciful heaven. How happy I was then. A small matter of old Fezziwig to make those silly folks so full of joy. Small matter? Small indeed. Isn't it? He has spent only a few pounds of your mortal money. Is that so much that he deserves praise? <laughs> it's not that. It's not that, Spirit. Old Fezziwig has the power to make us happy or unhappy, to make our service light or heavy. His power lies in words and looks and in things so tiny that it's impossible to count them up. The happiness he gives is quite as great as if it cost a... Uh, uh, what is the matter? Oh, oh, nothing. Nothing at all, Spirit. Something, I think? No, n no. Speak. Well, only... It's just that I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk, Bob Cratchit, that's all. My time grows short, and we have yet another journey to make. Where now? Come. This is our last visit to your past, Ebenezer. Here in this little room, with a fair young girl by your side, do you recognize yourself, Ebenezer? No, 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 no. Sp spare me this. You're older now, a man in his prime of life. Your face has begun to wear the signs of care and avarice. Your eyes are greedy, the eager, restless eyes of a miser. No, no please. She knows it too, that girl by your side. There are tears in her eyes. It matters little to you, very little. I know that. Belle, have I changed toward you? When we were engaged, we were both poor. Was it better then? Better to be poor? Better at least to be happy. You're changed. You were another man then. I was a boy. You blame me because I've grown wiser? Have I tried to break our engagement? In words, no. Never. In what then? In a changed nature. In an altered spirit. In everything that made my love of any value in your sight. So I release you from your promise. Belle! Oh, at first, it may cause you pain to lose me. A very brief pain. But soon it will be dim. Like a half-remembered dream. An unprofitable dream. And you will be glad to be awake from such a dream. May you be happy in the life you've chosen, Ebenezer, for the love of whom you once loved. That's enough. Show me no more. Take me home. These were the shadows of things that have been, that they are what they are. Do not blame me. No. No more. On the stroke of one, Scrooge awakened suddenly and sat bolt upright in his own bed. He remembered the words of Marley's ghost and wondered from which direction the second specter would appear. At that moment, nothing between a baby and a rhinoceros would have astonished him very much. Now, being prepared for almost anything, he was not by any means prepared for nothing, and consequently when no shape appeared— he was taken with a violent fit of trembling. Five minutes, ten minutes, a quarter of an hour went by, yet nothing came. Then, as he sat in his bed, he became aware gradually of a great blaze of ruddy light, which seemed to shine upon him from the adjoining room. 
he got up softly and shuffled in his slippers to the door. It was his own sitting room, no doubt about that, but it had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceiling were so hung with living green that it looked a perfect grove, from every part of which bright gleaming berries glistened and such a mighty blaze went roaring up the chimney as had never been known in Scrooge's time or for many and many a winter season gone. Heaped up on the floor to form a kind of throne were turkeys, geese, game, poultry, great joints of meat, sucking pigs, long wreaths of sausages, mince pies, plum puddings, barrels of oysters, red-hot chestnuts, and seething bowls of punch that made the chamber dim with their delicious steam. In easy state upon this couch there sat a jolly giant, glorious to see, who bore a glowing torch in shape not unlike Plenty's horn, and held it up, high up, to shed its light on Scrooge as he came peeping round the door. Come in, come in, Ebenezer Scrooge, and know me better, man. Who? Who? I am the ghost of Christmas present. Look upon me. You've never seen the like of me before. You're, you're different from the other spirit. You're tall, almost a, a giant, and that great torch you carry. Its light pours into the homes of rich and poor alike. Spirit, take me where you will. Last time I went against my will and learnt a lesson which is working now. If you have anything to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe, Ebenezer Scrooge. Touch my robe. Where have you brought me, spirit? A humble dwelling in a humble street. It's humble enough. Yet there is happiness there. Who are these people? Who's that woman and the children? These are the family of your clerk, Bob Cratchit. His wife, dressed in a twice-turned gown, but brave in ribbons, laying the table for their Christmas dinner. And then, assisting her, is her daughter, Belinda. And the young man with the fork and the stuffing, that's Master Peter Cratchit. And the two little Cratchits, listen, Scrooge. Why, bless your heart alive, Martha, my dear. Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas, Mother. How late are you, my dear? Oh, we had a deal of work to finish up last night, and we had to clear away this morning. Well, never mind so long as you hear now. Sit ye down before the fire and have a warm. Lord bless ye. Where's Father? He's been to church with Tiny Tim. They'll be along directly. How is Tiny Tim, Mother? Any better at all? Sometimes I think he is, and sometimes I think... Oh, dear. Dear God, if anything should happen to Tiny Tim... Mother, you mustn't even think of such a thing. There's Tiny Tim. Merry Christmas, everybody. Martha, welcome, my dear. Merry Christmas, Father. And Tim... Merry Christmas, Martha. Oh, Tim, you darling. Oh, Father, I'm so glad to be home. And we're so glad to have you, Martha. And how did little Tim behave in church, Bob? Oh... As good as gold and better. I like church, Mother. Oh, they sang the nicest songs. I hope people saw me there. Saw you there? And why, Tim? Well, don't you see? Because I'm lame. And if they saw my crutch, it might be pleasant for them to remember on Christmas who it was made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Oh, bless you, my son. Are we ready to eat, Mother? Yes, children, we're all ready. Come, come, take your place now. And Bob, wait your turn. There's plenty. Stuffing and dressing and plum pudding for you all. Martha, you take care of Tiny Tim. Yes, Mother. And now, my dears, shall we say grace? Spirit, tell me if Tiny Tim will live. I see a vacant seat in the poor chimney corner and a crutch without an owner. Oh, no, no. No, no, kind spirit. Say he'll be spared. Say he'll live. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, Ebenezer, the child will die. Amen. Amen. And now, my dears, with such a dinner a toast, a Merry Christmas to us all, and God bless us. God bless us, everyone. And now, to Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. Founder of the feast, indeed. 
Who pays you all the 15 shillings a week? I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast on. Oh, my dear, the children. It's Christmas Day. Well, it should be Christmas Day, I'm sure. On which one drinks the health of such an odious, stingy, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge? You know he is, Bob. Nobody knows it better than you. Poor fellow. My dear Christmas Day. I'll drink his health for your sake, and the day's not for his. Long life to him. A merry Christmas and a happy new year. He'll be very merry and very happy. I have no doubt. And I say, God bless him too, mother. And everyone. There was nothing of high mark in all this. They were not a handsome family, these Cratchits. They were not well dressed. Their shoes were far from being waterproof. Their clothes were scanty and had known very likely the inside of a pawnbroker's. But they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another and contented with the time. When, at last, they faded, Scrooge had his eye upon them and especially on Tiny Tim until the last. Many calls Scrooge made that night with the ghost of Christmas present. Down among the miners they went, who labor in the bowels of the earth and out to sea among the sailors at their watch, dark, ghostly figures in their several stations. Much they saw and far they went, and many places they visited, but always with a happy end. The spirit stood beside sick beds and they were cheerful, on foreign lands, and they were close at home, by poverty, and it was rich. In almshouse, hospital, and jail, where vain man in his little brief authority had not made fast the door, and barred the spirit out, the spirit left his blessing. It was a long night, if it was only a night, and it was strange, too, that while Scrooge remained unaltered in his outward form, the ghost grew older, clearly older. My life upon this globe is very brief, Ebenezer. It ends tonight. Tonight? Tonight at midnight. Hark, the hour has come. Oh, no, no, not yet, not yet. There there are still more things I wish to learn. These you will learn from another spirit. Still another spirit, Ebenezer. Scrooge looked about him for the ghost. It had vanished, and he found himself once more in his bed, in his dressing gown and his nightcap on his head. He heard the clock strike, and then he remembered the prediction of old Jacob Marley, and lifting up his eyes, beheld the third spirit, a solemn phantom, shrouded in black, draped and hooded, coming towards him slowly and silently, like a mist along the ground. I know you... You, you're the ghost of Christmas yet to come. You'll show me the shadows of things that have not yet happened, but will happen in the time before us. Answer me, spirit, ghost of the future. I fear you more than any specter I've seen. Yet I know your purpose is to do me good. And as I hope to live to be another man from what I was, lead on. Lead on, the night's waning fast, and time's precious. Spirit, why have you brought me here again, here to Bob Cratchit's home? But it's, it's not the same. What? Why is it so quiet, so very quiet here? <coughs> mother, mother, please. Oh, my son, my little son, Tiny Tim, I loved him so. Oh, mother, dear, you mustn't. It's almost time for father to be home. Don't let him see you crying. Yes, yes, Martha. He's late tonight. He walks slower than he used to, and yet I've known him to walk very fast indeed with Tiny Tim on his shoulder. So have I, Mother. But 
he was light to carry, and his father loved him so that it was no trouble. No trouble. Bob. Good evening, my dear. You're late, Bob. Yes. I'm sorry, my dear. I, I went to the churchyard today. I wish you could have gone with me. It would have done your heart good to see how sweet and green a place it is, but you'll see it often, I promised him. Yes, I promised Tiny Tim we'd walk there on a Sunday. Father, dear, it's God's will, Bob. I'm trying to understand that, my dear. My son, my little son, Tiny Tim, oh, and I loved him so. Oh, that's cruel, cruel. Spirit, can't you give me one ray of hope that I may change all that? That Tiny Tim may live? Where are you taking me now? Here, uh, on a common street, Spirit? What is there for me to learn here? Who, who are those men? I don't know much about it either way. I know he's dead. When did he die? And last night, I believe. It's likely to be a cheap funeral, for upon my life, I don't know anybody to go to it. Suppose we make up a party and volunteer. I don't mind going, if lunch is provided. <laughs> <laughs> uh, come to think of it, I'll bet I was his best friend. What? We used to nod to each other when we met in the street. <laughs> Spirit, help me. Who is this man that died? Is there no one to mourn the poor creature? No one to follow him to the grave? Perhaps they'll give him a green grave at least, like poor Tiny Tim. Perhaps... Spirit! Where are we now? Merciful heaven, a churchyard? Desolate, lonely, crumbling gravestones? Spirit, before I draw near to that gravestone, answer me one question. Are, are these shadows of things that will be, or are they shadows of things that may be only? Huh? Will, will you not speak to me, Spirit? What is that grave to which you point? Ah... Uh. Now I see it. Uh -huh. There's writing on that stone. The name on the gravestone is... Ebenezer Scrooge. Ebenezer Scrooge! Oh, no, no, spirit, no, 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 hear me. I'm not the man I was. Why show me this if I'm past all hope? Tell me that I can change these dreadful shadows you show me by an altered life. I'll honor Christmas in my heart. I'll... I'll try to keep it all the year. I'll live in the past, the present, and the future. And I'll not shut out the lessons that they teach. Tell me, spirit. Oh, go on, tell me. Tell me that I can sponge away the writing on that stone, spirit. I beg you, spirit. I beg you. Spirit. I promise. I promise on my knees. I promise. I promise. I... Oh. What? What's this? It's my own draper. Oh, I'm home. In my own bed. In my own room. And the sun. The sun's shining. It's clear. It's bright. No fog. What a beautiful day. Oh, glorious, glorious. Hey, 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 boy. Oh, boy. Yes, sir. What? What's today? What's that, sir? What day is it, my fine fellow? Today? Why, it's Christmas Day! Ha <laughs> ha Christmas Day! Then I haven't missed it! The spirits have done it all in one night! All in one night, heaven be praised! Uh, how's that, sir? Listen, my lad, uh, you know where the poulter is? In the next street? I should say I do! Ha! An intelligent boy! A remarkable boy! Tell me, do you know if they sold the prize turkey that was hanging in the window? The one that was as big as me? <laughs> what a delightful boy! It's a pleasure to talk to you. Yes, my buck. It's hanging there now, sir. That's wonderful. Go down, will you, and tell him to send it to Bob Cratchit and his family on Broad Street. And mind you, they're not to know who paid for it. Go along. Hurry, hurry, my lad. Here, here, wait a minute. Here's a half crown for your trouble. <laughs> 
Yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. And, and a Merry Christmas, sir. <laughs> and a Merry Christmas to you, my boy. Oh, I don't know what to do. I'm as light as a feather, as happy as an angel. I'm as merry as a schoolboy. Merry Christmas. A Merry Christmas to everybody. A Happy New Year to the, all the world. Woo-hoo-hoo. Hello. My dear sir, how do you do? I beg your pardon? Well, you, sir, aren't you the gentleman who came to my office in regard to that charity? Why, yes, sir. A Merry Christmas to you. Uh, yes, sir. Al- allow me to ask your pardon, sir. And will you have the goodness to accept... I prefer to whisper this. What? 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 But, Lord bless me! My dear Mr. Scrooge, are you serious? If you please now, not a farthing less. <laughs> a great many back payments are included in it, I assure you. <laughs> Will you do me that favor? W- well, my sir, I don't know what I can say to so much money. Mu- now, mu- don't say anything, please. Come and see me, will you? Will you come and see me? I will. I will indeed. <laughs> thank you. I'm about to oblige to you. I thank you 50 times. Bless you. Merry Christmas. Next morning, Scrooge was early at his office. He went early for a reason. If he could only be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late, that was the thing he'd set his heart upon. And he did it. Yes, he did. The clock struck nine. No Bob. A quarter past. No Bob. Scrooge sat with his door wide open that he might see him come in. At last he came. His hat was off before he opened the door. His comforter, too. He was on his stool in a jiffy, driving away with his pen as if he were trying to overtake nine o'clock. Fifteen and twenty-one, six and carry the one, and twenty-four and carry the two, thirty-one and eight and nine and eight. Hello, Bob Cratchit. Yes, sir? Step this way, Cratchit, if you please. Cratchit, what do you mean by coming in at this time of day? Why, I am very sorry, sir. I am behind my time. You are, yes, yes, I think you are. Oh, it, it's only once a year, Mr. Scrooge. It shall not be repeated. I, I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. I'll tell you what, my friend. I'll not stand this sort of thing any longer, and therefore, Bob Cratchit... I'm about to raise your salary. Mr. Scrooge, are you quite yourself, sir? No. No, thank heaven, I'm not quite myself. Merry Christmas, Bob. (laughs) Merry Christmas, my good fellow. A merrier Christmas than I've given you in many a year. I shall raise your salary, and we'll see what we can do for Tiny Tim and the rest of your family. (laughs) We... We'll discuss it this very afternoon over a Christmas bowl of smoking bishop. Bob, make up the fire, make it up, and and buy another coal scuttle before you dot another eye, Bob Cratchit. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all, and infinitely more. To Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the good old city knew or any other good old city, town, or borough in the good old world. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him, but he let them laugh, and little heeded them. His own heart laughed. That was quite enough for him. He had no further intercourse with spirits, but lived upon the total abstinence principle ever afterwards. And it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well, if any man alive possessed the knowledge." May that be truly said of us, of all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone!